I think it's pretty obvious. And by the way, who gets the uh, foreign direct investment? Because we are seeing, as the uh, free trade agreements are increasing in number, FDI inflows into poor nations are also increasing as FDI inflows into poor and <coughs> rich nations are decreasing. Who are the primary recipients? Countries with very big populations that are very poor, but with stable governments. Stability. And right now, Mexico and Brazil are not even really the uh, countries of choice, because as we're going to see, they're too expensive. Now we're looking more and more toward India and China. And we're going there, obviously, for what? The cheap labor. In the United States, if you want to take a look here, and this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay, I guess we're going to have a little technical difficulties following us. But in the United States, a worker is going to make about $23 an hour, and Canada about 21 versus a Brazilian that makes three, or a Mexican that makes about two and a half. So why would I want to build a new Ford plant in, a, in America or Canada when I can build it in Mexico with NAFTA at $2.50 an hour? And notice that when NAFTA was passed in 94, we just didn't go up. We were told we were going to go up. We didn't. They stayed flat. Okay? So, guess what? That's not good enough. That's too expensive. Why would I have two dollars? My God, that's a lot of money. Why would I pay two dollars? These are the typical wages for a power workers in factories in various parts of the world. How about a penny in Bangladesh? Penny an hour. How about 50 cents for power workers in Mexico? Or 24 in Romania? Uh, in Sri Lanka, Indonesia, I can't, I can't read this whole thing, but what is the source of this? Uh, this is the National Labor Committee. It's, uh, uh, yes, and do you know the source of their data? Uh, well, they actually go themselves directly into these countries, and they do a Yes, I heard Charlie, and I'm not sure I Yes, it. they collect yeah. the data themselves. Yeah. They actually go to these countries yeah. and talk directly to the workers and get the peace notes. So this is as close as you can get to practical, you know, hands-on collection of data. From the National Labor Committee. Charlie's a very effective advocate. So, yeah. Now, obviously, the production that's moving into these countries has to be able to come back out. That's again the role of the WTO and the FTAs. Because clearly, the people that are making a penny an hour, or $2 you know, an hour, cannot afford to buy a Ford automobile or a flat screen TV. So, this is all intended to come back where? Into the world consumption regions so of the United States, Japan, and Europe. And that's shown, the numbers are a little small here, but again, this is from the US Trade uh, Bureau. The numbers show that as the FTAs were increasing, look at, the, look at the trade deficit of the United States, ballooning. Because this is showing that all these goods are coming right back to be consumed in the countries that have the wages to buy them. They're not made to be consumed in the countries where they were produced. So that's the benefit of the WTO and FTA. However, these two SSAs, on uh, finance and trade, would be meaningless without the third and most important new global SSA, which is based on a global labor report with totally defeated labor. <coughs> so we have an emerging global SSA based on internationally segmented labor. In other words, we have regions of authoritarian production, such as in China, India, where the labor conditions are that of 1800s England, if not worse. And then we have a region of democratic consumption in the Western nations that are supposed to buy these products. And the beauty of this system with international segmented labor is that obviously <coughs> free trade is not free. Because according to classical economics, if you're going to have free trade, okay, it's not going to be just free trade of products, which means that you get international prices now. This is the international price for copper, for steel, or whatever, an equilibrium price. Well, you should have seen that for labor as well. Price, uh, uh, the cost of labor in uh, high, highly work, uh, cost countries should have come down as uh, wages would be increasing in low wage countries. We're not seeing that. Why? Because people are not allowed movement. That's not free trade. People are forced to stay in countries as cheap surf labor. They can't move out. They have to stay there. Okay? And as far as the wages go for the developed nations, you can discipline your labor forces with the threat of outsourcing. And now more and more people, especially in the United States, are contingent workers. Uh, you don't like what we give you. You don't want to give us uh, uh, cutbacks. You don't want to give us uh, your pensions back, whatever. No problem. We'll go to Indonesia. We'll go somewhere else. 
So you have a discipline of labor in both parts of the world. And that brings us back to that uh, argument of a core periphery divide. You have to have segmented labor, the core of labor in the periphery. Now, this is all reflected, and again, I apologize for this, it's reflected in the declining uh, GDP rates that we've been seeing. Uh, if you were able to see on this side, we'd see that in the United States, as well as the other countries, as the free trade regimes have been increasing, yeah, the number of them, the uh, yeah. I'm trying, but if I move the mouse, what's that? Oh, there we go. Thanks. Yeah. See, it takes me to the other. <coughs> and I, I can't yeah. see my screen here to click back. That's the problem. You can up. Just up. Oh, okay. There we go. Now, I did this uh, based on um, per capita because I think that's a little bit more accurate in terms of population changes, the growth of population. So if we look here, since the 1990s, the real GDP rate, and this is com uh, comparable because it's purchasing power parities, it's very small. And that's because production is increasingly moving outside of these developed nations. And that's reflected, I believe, in GDP rates. Now, of course, there's a lot that's related to why we have trade deficits, a lot related to why this is falling. But I'm trying to paint a very broad picture here. Now, in turn, what we are seeing is increasing inequality in developed nations. This is the Gini coefficient. And you can see that the bigger the Gini number is, the more inequality you have. And this is for the United States. And as free trade has been increasing, and internationally segmented labor has become more of a daily phenomenon, so has inequality increased. And not only is inequality increasing, because you can say it's a bigger pie, you know, inequality may not matter that much. It's a smaller piece, but of a much larger pie. But if you were to look at economic data, whether it's from the Economic Policy Institute and other sources, wages, also in developed nations, have been flat. They, they have not been going up. And you have increasing inequality, which is also shown by the income shares that people receive. Sorry, where are these? This is for the United States, and these are basically, <coughs> this is all data from the United States government. Um, did I go off too high? Uh, oh, well. So you have income shares that are declining for uh, the bottom 80% of the population. Now, if people don't have the, the ability to buy what corporations are selling, I believe that's also going to be reflected in corporate profit rates. And it's been calculated, and I have a source here, that as the old SSA has been declining, corporate properties have been declining as well. But I would say this is not because of competition alone. I would say it's because of inadequate aggregate demand, because of inadequate purchasing power. That's what's creating this fall in profit rates, at least to some extent. I, I'd be suspicious of those figures. Well, I, mean, I, 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 would, I don't know how they were refereed that article. Uh, well, the data itself is the article came from business. Yeah, yeah, that's not. Well, again, I'm just trying to paint a very broad picture here. Um, but let me go one more down. Okay. So what we're, what we're seeing is that we have outsourcing into world production regions where people cannot really afford to buy the products they're making. And then we're having all this product come back into the developed region to be consumed. Now, the problem here is you're going to say to me, that, well, China's so, you know, fine and dandy, but how do you know that the Chinese consumer is not necessarily going to consume the products they're making? Well, in addition to not making a lot of money, for example, it's been calculated that the Chinese worker makes about 50 to 60 cents an hour. What we're seeing is that the corporations are keeping the benefits of globalization and increased productivity all to themselves. It's not like it's being shared in another part of the world. Why? 